Hi and welcome. My name is Torbjörn Nordling and I'm an assistant professor in automatic control at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the National Shengong University in Tainan, Taiwan. I'm also the general chair of this workshop. Now behind me I have a piece of art created by students from the National Tainan University of Arts in 2009. This piece titled Reaction of Love symbolizes how a major when it reaches maturity will have a major impact on other fields and it's located behind the chemistry department building. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our honorary chair, Chair Professor Wu, who will give his welcome address. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the National Chengkang University in Taiwan. I am proud that our team, the NCKU Parkinson's Disease Quantifiers, are one of the finalists in the OpenCV AI competition. They are also arranging this workshop. Now let us all learn computer vision and AI using the OCD camera together. Hello and welcome. I am Akram Ashani, postdoc researcher at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of National Chengkong University in Taiwan and assisting chair of this workshop. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Anthony Newman, who is a senior publisher with Elsevier. He is currently responsible for 17 laboratory medicine and biochemistry journals. He joined Elsevier over 30 years ago and has been publisher for the last 20 years. Before then, he was the marketing communications manager for the biochemistry journals of Elsevier. By training, he is a polymer chemist and was active in industry before leaving London and moving to Amsterdam in 1987 to join Elsevier. He will present how to write great papers and get them published. Please enjoy it. So, hello, welcome. My name is Anthony Newman. I'm a publisher at Elsevier in Amsterdam. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to give this presentation about how to write great papers and get them published, of course. And uh, this is relevant for any researcher in that if you're not able to publish your research work, it's in effect is invisible. So it's really essential that you become successful at publishing as well as researching. So I'm going to be sharing now a set of slides in PowerPoint and afterwards these are going to be available uh, through the organizers for anyone who wants them, as well, of course, as this recording. So let me now just share my screen. And you can now see uh, the slideshow. So the first slide is obviously how to write great papers. But um, you might be asking yourself, do I need to know these things? Isn't it intuitive? Well, we would like it to be intuitive, but it's, it's not really. There's so many tips and tricks that I'm going to help you in the next hour or so. Just, just do this and go through things. So of course, uh, journals publishing was in the uh, initial area was based specifically in print and it's going out to electronic nowadays. So now we're at the level of over 2000 publishers in the field, 28,000 peer reviewed journals and just under 2 million peer reviewed articles per year, which means that you and all your colleagues out there researching are generating about 2 million articles a year. We've all got to go somewhere. There's lots and lots of journals around which you can choose to submit to. And of course, if you don't publish, as I said, it's invisible. So you've got to publish either in a journal or in a, a book, um, some sort of monograph or whatever. And what you're going to be publishing, of course, is uh, also very important. So if you don't publish, 
then no one knows you're working on it. Uh, everyone has, needs to see what you've been doing, particularly if you're being funded by someone. And you should be publishing new and original results and methods or reviews. And the idea is, although you can publish sound manuscripts, it's pretty better if you can produce manuscripts that advance the field in some way or another. There's only so many things people can read to at least give them something that is new to them and helps the field continue to grow. You shouldn't be publishing reports that aren't scientific, out of date or duplicates. And you need a strong, effective manuscript to compete with other people. Uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, the rejection rate was about 30% of papers. So the acceptance rate was 70%. Now it's reversed. Now only about 30% of submitted papers get accepted because there's so many papers being sent in. Even though there's more and more journals, there's still more articles being written than can get published in these. So therefore, you've got to have a very good message of content and presentation style. It has to be good content, of course, all your research, and present it in a good way. If you don't do uh, one or the other, it doesn't work. You've got to be good content and well presented. Otherwise, uh, it's a sad waste of your research time. So what is, is a strong manuscript? It's novel, of course, it's clear, it's useful, it's exciting. Uh, and then you've got to transmit that somehow uh, to the reader. It has to be in a logical manner. So you've got to be reading through it in a way that makes sense. And that means that uh, the people reading it will be actually understanding what's going on. So here is the problem, here's what we, we saw, um, here's what we did, uh, and now here's what you think is going on, what do you think? So that's the idea of a logical process. It should not be chronological, it should be logical. Not the sequence you did things, but the sequence you want to explain to the reader. And of course, the reviewers and editors are busy people, and to send the journal reviewers the article for peer review, you've got to make sure they understand the significance easily. Many people do not focus on what the important aspects of their paper are. They're assuming wrongly that the editors, reviewers, readers will grasp the significance very, very quickly. It's far more important to state clearly what you did and why you think it's important. Uh, it's, we, we tend as scientists uh, to be sort of circumspect about how we describe our work and we don't describe it in a very, very clear way. And you've got to do this very clearly in a paper as to what uh, things you found and why you think it's significant. And of course, to get out to peer review, first the, it's got to get past the, the barrier called the editor. The editor does often desk reject poor quality papers and sends the other ones out to reviewers and then they, they come back with various comments uh, and then you go from there. So before you start publishing, before you start writing, you've got to work out what's out there. You don't want to be writing something to find it's actually been done before. And so therefore always go looking and see what you can find. So you've got some strategic information gathering. You, you go um, online, you do searching in say, Scopus Web of Science or PubMed or whatever, and see what's available there, see what you know, what you don't know, articles you don't know, then record them, read them through, and see if you're going to use them or not uh, in your references. And that's the, the important aspect, because you've got to know what's the latest research out there too. And before you start writing, you've got to say, okay, why am I doing this? Um, what have I researched? Is it new? Is it interesting? Is it a hot topic? Has it given solutions to some problems like other people have said they couldn't do something, now you, you can? And have you got all these things all in place? Uh, are you ready to publish? Is there anything else you still need to do, an extra experiment or not? If you got to the stage where everything is sort of explainable, uh, then that's the point you can start thinking about preparing for your manuscript. Then you've got to ask yourself the question, what sort of manuscript, a full article so, or a short article? Um, review paper, uh, and perhaps even some new manuscript types, for example, uh, data in brief or, or graphical reviews or other similar things. If you're not sure what's best, uh, check with other people, uh, perhaps your supervisor or colleagues, because they also have a good idea what's the most important, most effective way of uh, presenting your research work. 
if you're not sure whether you should do a full article or a short article, just look at the uh, the various length that you're going to be writing it and see what some journals expect to have in, in terms of articles length, uh, and that will help you. I would not write the manuscript first before choosing your journal in case they've got certain rules. If you've just written a very long, wonderful article and then you choose a journal, it turns out they've got a, a limit on words, word count, and you're over that. That means you've got to edit right back your nice uh, manuscript. So far better to uh, to work out what the rules are before you start writing. So to find the right journal, you've got to be thinking about what's good for you, but also more importantly, what's good for the reader? Where would the reader be expecting to find this article? Where's their comfort zone of this particular topic area? Look at your references. Where are you going to be citing? Are there certain journals there which are useful and uh, often come back? Uh, so all of these various potential publications are called candidate journals. And you and your perhaps co-authors can see how many you've got, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever. Uh, ask yourself questions like, how good is the peer review? Is it really, really a, a high quality top flight journal like Nature or Cell or Science, where the peer review is really hostile um, and uh, it's difficult to get published? Or is it quite the reverse? So almost no peer review. Uh, and so that's not helpful at all. So always work out what you think is happening or know from other people's experience about the peer review uh, process of that journal. How about the journal's audience? Who's going to read it? Well, we assume that the authors equals the readers. Um, so therefore, if you can find articles in there similar to your work, then that's a good place for your work to be published. And how fast is a journal in making a decision or in publishing your work? That's also important, important to know. And of course, the things like the impact metrics, the, uh, the, the SNP, uh, the SJR, uh, the, the site score, the impact factor and so on. If you need to publish open access uh, because either you've been funded or your university or institute uh, has this policy, then it's another aspect as well. And also make sure, particularly if you're going to publish open access, that the journal you're going to submit to is a real journal. There's too many fake journals out there or predatory journals out there. Uh, and so if you're publishing open access, then look at the directory of open access journals. DOAJ, because that, if it's in there, then it, it's in effect a real journal. If it's not, it probably isn't. So to find the right audience, um, you've got to sort of work out what's the best thing to do. You can look at other various journals that what they've been publishing and see if it's the right sort of topic areas for you. Ask your university library, because they offer advice about things like the processing time of, of journals. And of course, your colleagues and supervisors, people who published before, might be helpful uh, in giving you some advice here. If you're not sure particularly which journal to go for, there's a new interesting option we have in Elsevier journals, which is uh, sort of AI technology, the journal finder. So with that, you can put in your abstract and keywords and title, and then you can see what the system thinks would be a good journal or two uh, within Elsevier. You don't have to go there, of course. You can then use that knowledge and then look for other journals in the same topic area with other publishing houses. It's just an extra service we are giving the, the authors. So you then got to the stage, you've got several potential uh, journals for your manuscript. And you then you and your co-authors have to put them in a sequence. You're not going to submit to all at once, because otherwise that means you're going to be what's called, called um, simultaneous submission and that's unethical and you can get banned uh, by various publishing houses for a couple of years of doing that. And so once you've worked out the sequence of your submission, you hope it's going to be journal A, it might be journal B or C or D, but you hope it's going to be journal A will be successful. And then so what you do is you then look at the guide to authors of journal A, because that will guide you in writing your manuscript. And when you've done that, then if you need to change your manuscript because Journal A declines you, then you look at Journal B's guide to authors, and then you edit your manuscript to match what Journal B wants to have. That's sort of the simplest process. Now, the guide to authors is there to help you. But it's also there to help the, uh, the, the editor better uh, understand 
uh, what you're doing. So they've asked you to do it in a certain way. They've asked you to do lay out the text, uh, the figures a certain way. They ask all sorts of different things uh, just to make it easier to evaluate your work. So always see the guide to authors as a, a great useful tool to have um, to get the manuscript in a way that editors can see it properly. Now, some editors are quite laid back about receiving articles that aren't in the style of the guide to authors, and some are not laid back. They're really, really annoyed. And so therefore, you don't know who's who. So always assume that the editor you're sending to would like to see your manuscript linked in using their guide to authors. And that's the best way to play safe. And again, there's all sorts of things that, that go wrong. Um, here's what an editor said to us. Uh, he gets papers out of scope. No one bothered to read the scope of his journal, which is a shame. And the guide to authors was there for a reason and not enough uh, of these manuscripts are in that format. And many people do not send appropriate reviewers or no reviewers. And uh, the comments of reviewers are not responded to appropriately. The English quality is poor and sometimes Manuscripts come back in without any revision whatsoever, hoping no one will notice. Of course they notice. And so from that point of view, you've really got to be working with the editor. They want to be um, an editor to help people get published, to help the film move forward. So if you work with them, they're thinking people too, and that should help you uh, in your process towards getting a good published paper. Now, of course, when you are writing, you're writing in a scientific language style and no one English first language, English second language, is ever taught how to write scientific articles. It's something you're supposed to absorb almost like osmosis. So you've got to write with clarity, objectivity, accuracy, and also very, very brief brevity. Seems simple, but it's not. So with successful scientific writing, you got to look at the sentence construction, uh, the tenses, the grammar, of course, English. Now, sentence construction, well, that's uh, something you've got to be aware of, that in some cultures you can have very long sentences and it's acceptable. But in writing for a scientific paper, you've got to do what, short, snappy sentences. And of course, the, the guide to authors will tell you even about language, because sometimes you have some journals will say British spelling only or American spelling only or whatever. Normally they say either British spelling or American spelling, not a mixture. So you and your co-authors have got to use the same spell checker, basically. So when you're doing short sentences, uh, short snappy sentences, if you have more than one concept in a sentence, it's too much. And so therefore break them up. It can be confusing. I think of it like uh, speaking when you when you're writing and giving a talk or something then each sentence is just a simple short few words and you take a breath and go further with the next sentence the same thing with writing scientific papers now with the authorship you and you, you and your co-authors we assume are all qualify uh, but maybe not uh, the important thing is who is an author who's allowed to be an author most journals have a, a, a very simple rule on this. They go by the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, who say that an, edit, an author must contribute substantially to concept design, data acquisition, interpretation, and so on, be involved with the drafting or revising, and approve the final full version, and also agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work. All four things make you an author. If you're not one of those, you're, you're different. You're actually called a knowledge individual. So someone who perhaps helped with the stats or someone who helped uh, lending a cell line or something, uh, someone who um, shared some software. These people can be acknowledged individuals, but they're not co-authors because they weren't involved in the concept, design, drafting, revision, and a final version of approval. And that, that's important to, to think about. Now, in terms of the authorship sequences, uh, who's first author, who's last author? Um, in most areas, the first author is uh, the person who's done most of the research work and gathers the data and arranges pulling the paper together, uh, making sure all the other co-authors contribute and make sure all the other co-authors agree to the final version and so on. And that person normally submits it to the journal. 
then the person, the name of the end, the senior author, is typically the person whose lab it is, or the person who's uh, who's the uh, supervisor of the postdoc or whatever. Uh, and, and so that's the normal process. But in some fields like physics, it's alphabetical. So it's you no, know, literally all the way through. You can't tell who's the who's the person who did most of the work and who's the person who's the senior author there. But uh, you can see looking at the journal of choice, journal A, how it's laid out, and that's how you lay it out. You shouldn't leave out any authors. They're called ghost authors, um, because if someone has uh, been involved somehow and they, they qualify because they were involved in, in the research gathering and data gathering interpretation, reach out to them, involve them in the authorship of this particular paper and add them as uh, a co-author. If they left the university and gone somewhere else, that's OK. You then put an asterisk next to their, their name at the top. At the bottom, there's a footer. You say, now at University X, quite simply. And of course, gift authors should not be there. That's people who've uh, contributed uh, in name but did nothing at all. Um, and sometimes there are some um, universities in various parts of the world who want to have the head of department in every single paper, whether he's seen the article or, or not, which is, is not the right way forward. But uh, these are things that are, we're constantly fighting against and we haven't quite won the battle yet. So an article structure varies from field to field, but typically you've got a certain layout. Now some journals even tell you what they want to have, and they tell you the sequence they want to have them, and some journals don't. So if you see in the guide to authors uh, a layout, and then the journal explains what they want to have, that's great. If you look at articles in the journal you're going to submit to, and it's all up, they're all laid out the same way, that's great. If not, you've got to think about perhaps using the typical structure, uh, which you can use, which works very well. Um, it actually is a fish. Now, why a fish? Because we use pictures to remember things. So think that the top is the head. So the title, abstract and keywords is the head. The body of the text is the, the body, the main text. Introduction, methods, results, discussion. And the tail is conclusion, acknowledgments, results, references rather, and supplementary data. So the top bit, uh, the title, abstracts, and keywords can be seen by anyone in the world, anywhere, because most of the databases out there of articles do give you the title, abstracts, and keywords free anywhere. You can be in Starbucks somewhere, you can be anywhere. You can see this. And of course, the main text, your results, and your discussion about these, uh, that's what makes your article specifically yours. Um, but make it as short as you can, not because general space is... Uh, is, is limited. Nowadays it's not, it's online, but the reader's time is scarce, so be as, as concise as you can, and it is a challenge. Um, and there, there are different ways things are laid out. So this is a research article. A review article would be a bit different. Um, you have social science articles, for example, have more discussion, less data. It varies from, from, from field to field, but still this layout is interesting. And you lay it out to read this way, but it's not how you write it. You write it like building a wall. So what you do is you think about it, you got the, you start with your comfort zone, the figures and tables, your data, and then you have the methods, results, discussion, you write back by back, and then conclusion, introduction, then title and abstract. That way it's easier, and it's within your comfort zone, and it means you're actually really able to, uh, to see uh, what's going on, and to explain properly, you don't get sort of brain freeze and when you've done all this, you deconstruct it and then you reconstruct it as a fish layout with the title at the top and so on. If you had never tried writing an article this way, building a wall, try it. You'll probably find it works very well for you. I wish I'd been taught this when I was studying. So look, using the fish style now, let's zip through some of the various aspects of the article. The title, of course, has to be as good as you can as few words as you can, but still very effective. So you identify the main issue of the paper and you begin with that, not at the end of the, of the title, but beginning, because the eyes scan the beginning a few words of the articles, uh, and then be as accurate as you can and as short as you can, which is a challenge. Uh, no weird abbreviations, and you've got to be attracting readers to hook them to go further than the title, to go into the, the abstract. That's, that's your wish. 
and then you have keywords of course where people can find you because uh, if they can't find you they're not going to go looking in various journals if they can't find you in their favorite search engine then it's not very helpful so make sure the keywords are okay and then also check out a few keywords and see what you can get back and if it brings back in your favorite search engine uh, the sort of articles that you expect to find similar to yours then it's a good set of keywords if not play around and then retest and retest and retest until you're actually generating lots of articles, hundreds, um, with the same topic area as yours. So when you've got this, read through all these various titles and see if any of them are unknown to you. It could be they've slipped past your, your attention this last year or two, and you might need to read them through and then cite them as a reference in your article. You can't ignore them because what will happen is that the ref referees will look at your references and using your keywords, if they can find these people and you haven't cited them, they're going to wonder why you left them out. Were you lazy or is there something strange going on in your paper? So always use this keyword selection as a sanity check for your references. Then you have the abstract, of course, and that's job is to tell readers what you did and what you found. And it varies from journal to journal. Typically, it's a paragraph, 250 words. Uh, and also you have the highlight, the highlights of bullet points uh, as well, which isn't counted in the number of words. And then also the graphical abstracts that they're allowed. So it's, all, it's telling the, the reader they've gone from the title to the abstract, and then it tells them, do they want to go further or not? Now you've all done this, you've, you've read a, a title and you've gone into the abstract and thought, oh, no, it's not for me, move on. So that abstract has done its job. But if the abstract is very clear and tells you what's down below, what, you, what was done or what was found, then it's also done its job because then the reader can go further in being interested in what you've told them is inside your article. So it's an advert in effect. And the abstract is seen by the potential referees. It's a title abstract and sometimes the authors, it depends on the journal involved, and the referees have to decide, do they want to review the paper based on the title and abstract? And if they do, they get to see the whole paper. If not, they do not. So again, a very clear abstract helps you get your reviewing process underway quicker and, cl and, and cleaner. So for example, here's what we did, and here's what we found, basically. Next bit in the, the fish model, the introduction. It mustn't be, uh, uh, it's, it's job is to tell people why what you've done works for them too, or is important to them too. Is there other problems, other solutions? What's best? Uh, are there limitations? What do you want to achieve? Now, if you remember the wall style, you wrote the introduction after you wrote the results and discussion. So therefore the introduction, what you hope to achieve just is what you've already written in the wall style to make sure it actually is, is logical and consistent here. So please pay attention that it's it's not going to be a history lesson. It's not everything. It's just to be there in front of all your new material, just to give the readers a chance to put it in perspective. And where where is your work in the whole uh, the spectrum of what's happening in the field? And you're not going to be mixing up the introduction results and so on. You're going to keep them separately all the way through fish style. You're not going to use things like amazing and first time and great uh, because it's not. Um, I only use relevant references because the references job has twofold. One is to tell the reader where to go and look for more information, more detailed information. And the other is to tell the reader why you're basing uh, your work on, which logical process, what scientific uh, findings. And so therefore, uh, if you don't use the right references, then the referees think that you're just padding out with references to, to famous people and so on, which is not what you want to, to be doing. The methods and experimentation, um, the referees would love to look over your shoulder while you're doing these experiments, and they can't because, of course, you're, you've written it up and you're, you're explaining it. So make sure you explain it in such a way the work can be replicated. Because if it can't be replicated, then it's not particularly helpful. If you've got certain equipment, mention uh, who supplied it and what particular equipment it was. If you use any chemicals for any reason, again, 
mentioning specifically, perhaps even the catalog number, if it gives the purity and so on. You've got to have control experiments in place. You've got to um, write all of your uh, descri description of the, what you did in the past tense. Uh, any discussion around what you found is later on under results uh, and discussion. And also you might want to use extra supplementary material like large spreadsheets and so on, but only short snappy spreadsheets inside the, the actual paper itself. If your journal you've chosen doesn't give you much space to do a really full methodology, then you can always do a short method and say, this is a cut down method. The full method protocol can be found in a supplementary file. So you or do not say I couldn't, give all the details because it didn't give me the space. There's always a way to do that. And if you don't uh, do this and people can't replicate your work, they're not gonna cite you. So you really have to make sure that your work can be replicated. And if you describe things in a very clear way, that then the referees are happy that what you're describing is a good method. And so any results you find have some value, any discussions around those have value. If your method looks a bit suspect, a bit sort of um, vague and uh, a bit sloppy, any results you find are also vague. Any conclusions you have are irrelevant. So always be as clear as you can with the method. They've got to be as, as really as detailed as you can be. Think of describing it to a friend in another part of the world and you want them to repeat the experiment. That's the level of detail you need to give to the reader and be their friend, basically. Now, with results, the challenge is to do um, the minimum possible sharing with the reader. This is a nice picture of an iceberg here. So think of uh, how much of the material do you want to, of your results you want to share with the reader and how much like the iceberg remains hidden. So you're gonna share the main findings, not everything, um, because the idea of sharing everything is just too much data and, and your novelty is lost in the sheer wealth of, of data overwhelms people. So this is the main findings, um, not everything. And the findings, of course, that you are gonna be sharing, make sure that the method section describes experiments used to get those findings. If you're doing lots of experiments, lots of different findings, make sure you only explain experiments with the findings you're gonna list. If you find anything that's different, to other people in the past, check it, double check it, make sure it's not an artifact. And if it is uh, a, real, a real event, that's good. Hang on to that because you'll talk about it in your discussion. And of course, make sure your stats are correct. If you're using the wrong stats package, it's not helpful at all. So make sure that you can have a, um, perhaps someone check using the right methodology uh, before you, you actually start doing all your stats analysis. With uh, results, if you can use figures and tables, uh, illustrations, it's better because it's easier for the reader to absorb the data if it's in the form of a, a graph or a, a figure or whatever. And so it's if you have a good figure and a good figure legend, you don't need to describe that in the text. So there's less writing for you the reader absorbs the data easier with the figure, figure legend. Uh, and so it's a win-win basically. So be as, as useful as you can by having as many figures as you can to present your work in a way that you have far less descriptive text letting the figures and, the, and their figure legend. It might need a very large figure legend, but that's okay. It's doing its job of helping the reader extract information from that figure. When you are using uh, figures, there's certain sort of conventions. You, you do a 3D plot, 2D plot, whatever. You use well laid out, good scales, uh, so it's easy to see what's going on. If it gets too confusing, then think about breaking into two separate plots uh, and, and explain what the two different things are. Any photograph uh, should have a scale marker, of course. There should be no text in the photographs. Uh, if they are, then, then make sure it's in English, but preferably uh, no text at all. Better to have that as a figure legend. Uh, you can use colour if you want to, if you need to, uh, but not weird and wonderful sort of flashy things just because your computer does that. Um, think about someone wanting to print this out in black and white. So make sure 
Um, the, the, the graph at the bottom which shows you the uh, blue, dark blue and sort of dark pink. When, when printed out, they're almost the same shade of gray. So you need to have, say, stars and, and, and diamonds or something as two different ways to, to mark the line to make it easier to, to see this in a, um, in a black and white printout. Or well, you can check it out yourself by printing in black and white to see what it looks like. And you also, if you need to, you can also add uh, notes, say, happy drug crystals. It's a way, again, to, to tell a reader who doesn't know what's going on something about this, just to help you tell the message. You're using the figures uh, to help explain uh, your results and, your, and explain your discussion with the reader. So anything that helps this uh, is a useful thing to do. Then, of course, you've got a discussion, and the discussion is explaining what your results mean. Now, you're explaining what you found, the results, and you're going to discuss them. And if you're not used to doing this, it could be that your data is, is good, but you're not discussing it very well. And you've really got to be quite um, clear on uh, what's going on. Uh, yeah, make sure that all of the results relate to the original question. And they should do because the introduction section was written after you did the discussion and the, and the results. Uh, make sure every single result that you are sharing is interpreted. If you're sharing eight results and you only discuss six of them, you either discuss two more or you chop two out. So you have six results and six discussions. And if other people have found different things, be upfront about this, you just say very clearly, other investigators have found something different, citation, citation. Uh, and then you say, well, we're sure it's not an artifact and here's what we think is going on. Uh, and so that's a useful thing to, to, to bring forward science. And also other limitations are, is the equipment uh, still available? Um, is, is that particular part of the world still available to repeat the experiment or whatever? And does it, your discussion also lead into the conclusion properly? Do not bring in new terms of ideas. And if the results say a certain thing, don't go wider than that, because that's just confusing to the reader. They've got enough information to absorb from you, which you're explaining clearly. You're bringing in new terms, ideas, and, and going broader than what the results support is just um, counterproductive. Your conclusions, of course, should be um, usefulness, what, what it can be used for, uh, the applications, and uh, also, of course, other experiments would be a useful thing to explain. So here's what we've done, here's what still needs to be done. And if you're going to do one of those already, or you already are, you can say, here's what we did, here's what still needs to be done. The first thing we're already working on. So you can work on other ones, people. So what you're saying in effect is come join us uh, and collaborate with us or stay away because we've just picket fenced this and we want to publish it. The conclusions are not summarizing the paper, that's the abstract's job. And of course you don't say what you think about the, the article here. Only others, when they cite you, can say how wonderful the work is. You must not, you've got to be in that way quite humble. So with the references, you've got to get them right. It's your job as an author to get them right. And so use the guide to authors. If you can use reference management software, that helps. Uh, check the reference style of the journal. If you're using anything that hasn't been uh, published per se, say it's a manuscript that's still not yet accepted and you desperately want it to, to, to uh, somehow mention it, then you can do this at a pinch if you get the editor in chief to agree to, to read the submitted manuscript to somewhere else. But it's far better not to do that. If you can also try and find references um, in English because you're assuming that um, if you can be referencing something in another language, not that many of your readers will be able to read this. So you're trying to help them. So do what you can to find the best sort of references, ones that will help them uh, do the job of teaching the reader a bit more about the topic area. Now you've got a chance to send a cover letter in to the editor. Some editors look at these very detailed and some don't, but at the same time, it's an extra chance to be accepted. So please do this. Uh, you submit it along with your manuscript and you mentioned why your manuscript is special. 
why should you uh, have your article in this journal? Perhaps the journal it really focuses on this topic area, or perhaps they published articles where they say certain things are difficult to do and you found some way to make it better. You just want to, in effect, sell your manuscript to the to the editor explaining why. The editors do two jobs. They're actually looking for filtering out the junk and also looking for top articles. So you're going to explain to them why you think it would be a good thing for their uh, journal to have your article here. And so when you do that, you then also mention potential referees. If the system doesn't let you do this in the submission process, uh, Elsevier insists, for example, you've got to do this in part of the submission process, but some publishing houses do not. And you mentioned that in the covering letter, your, poten your potential reviewers. Um, why do you mention potential reviewers? It's to help the editor review your article should they want to do this. Um, do you ask the names of people, the people you've named, uh, if they want to be on the review or not? No, you don't. It's anonymous peer review, so you say nothing. And you mention them. Do, and there's certain rules about who you should be using, who you shouldn't. There should be various parts of the world. They shouldn't be people you've published with in the last two or three years. Uh, they shouldn't, of course, be your close friend or your uncle in Canada or something. They, they should be people who you would really, really like to review your paper to make your paper better. That's the bottom line, in effect. Some journals will ask for three, some six. One of my journals asks for eight potential referees because they want to have two people to say yes, and they want to ask that many to have two. Will they use your referee suggestions? Sometimes. Will they use one of theirs, one of yours? Sometimes. They'll probably try to use their own, and if they get no one wanting to, uh, uh, to have the time to review your paper, they'll look at your suggestions. Always give the contact details with the email address of the institute. No Hotmail, Gmail, anything else, because otherwise uh, that's suspicious for an editor. It might be a fake referee. So always use the institutional email address of the potential referee. So you've got to do everything you can to make your submission a success. Uh, so you write it and, and you leave it for a few days and you come back and your subconscious thinks, wow, that's a mess. And then you polish it some more. Uh, you really, really polish the article because it might even get published and accepted first time round. Um, and you ask your colleagues, your supervisor, what they think about it. And they might be critical, but they're trying to make your paper better. And then when you get all the various comments from all the various people around you and your co-authors, you and your co-authors discuss the suggestions and work out what's going to be incorporated, what suggestions incorporated, who's going to do this, uh, and then it gets done. And then when it's done, all the co-authors have to approve this version. You can't just do it yourself and send it in because they can disagree with you and ask you to withdraw the paper. Uh, make the changes or withdraw the paper, take their name off, then we submit. So always make sure all the co-authors are actually on board. Then you start to think about, is it time to submit the article? Is it in good English? Is it polished? You can't say, I'll wait until it comes back because then it'll be um, time to polish it. No, it won't come back because it will be rejected as being too poor quality English. You have no chance to submit a, another version. So then it goes into the peer review process. The peer review process to the author looks like a, a black box. You just push the button and it goes. What happens, the author submits a paper, uh, is a dotted line there, is it, before it gets to the editor, it's checked for a plagiarism checker with called cross check. And it's also uh, the service we use checks, are there enough article papers in there, article enough figures in there? Because if you say you're going to submit four figures, did you submit four figures or not? These are the sort of basic things. It gets to the editor, and the editor then says, okay, uh, is it within scope? No. Okay, that's a reject straight away. So that's a reject. Is it poor English? That's a reject also. Is it basically within scope? Okay. Um, so who do I send it to? Who are the best people for me to assign this, uh, this manuscript to? And so, uh, the editor, she or he, thinks of a couple of people, ask them, and they've got a few days to say yes, uh, or they time out. If they say yes, fine, they've got a 
a couple of weeks to review the paper. If they decline, then the editor has to find some more people. Eventually, there's two reviewers who agree, and after a few weeks, they come back with the recommendations. Reviewers do not make a decision, they make recommendations. And based on the recommendations, the editor makes a decision, which is to accept as is, very rare, to reject, common, or to revise the paper. So that's the process we have in the peer review system. If it's accepted as is, very rare. Um, in, in my field of life sciences, it's one in 200 papers. And uh, so if you have a paper written and it's accepted as is with no revision, amazing, which means the next paper you submit that gets rejected or major revision category is a bit of a, a bit of a letdown. If you're rejected, yeah, it happens. Uh, even Nobel laureates get rejected. Uh, it happens to everyone. And try to understand why. Be very careful about what they've said. Read what it says. It might say your paper is rejected unless you do this, 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 then resubmit. Or it might say your paper is rejected because of this, in which case you know very clearly. So you and your co-authors must read through this so-called rejection letter to make sure what it says what it says. Sometimes we say, read it between the lines, reject and resubmit. In other words, it's called reject with hope letter. If you do submit to another journal, you've got to remember it's like a new manuscript. You've got journal B. You had the original journal A, B, C, D, E. Journal B, you then do a different cover letter, of course. Uh, you then read the guide to authors of journal B. And if you need to do a different reference style, uh, you export from your reference management tool a different layout for journal B, and then you send it to journal B. But of course, before you do that, all the reviewers' comments will be taken on board because they've made your paper better. So therefore, that's the, a great thing to do. If it's the revision process, it either is a, a full you know, a revision, it's called a major revision, or it's a minor revision. A minor revision goes back to the editor uh, for them to see, did you make the changes requested? If you did, more than likely you could be accepted. If it's a major revision, it goes back to the reviewers to see if their concerns have been addressed. If they are okay, then it, off it goes back again. Sometimes you'll get a major revision followed by a minor revision. These things happen. So that's some more details about that. When you are replying with the revision, revised manuscript, you do a, a response letter. It's basically, uh, it's a cut and paste of each reviewer's comments. You've all of those comments to reviewers, reviewer A, reviewer B, point one, two, three, four, five, and so on. You just cut and paste you each comment and then your response below it. Some journals ask you to send in two versions, a clean version and a color coded version of the revision to help it make it easier for the editor to see what you've done. Do not say, thank you for all the comments, we made all the changes, it's now fixed, without showing what you've done, because that will annoy the referee, sorry, the editor intensively, because they don't know what they were asked to do and what you did, because that was perhaps 25, 30, 40 uh, manuscripts ago that uh, they did this. So always be very clear what you've done and why you've done it. Um, some journals even ask you to use line numbers and page numbers. So just make sure you, you do what you're asked to do. If you don't like a particular comment um, and you don't disagree with it scientifically, then you and your co-authors can then write a rebuttal uh, to the editor-in-chief saying that you think the reviewer was wrong and explaining why. Be very polite. Remember that this comment, this rebuttal, will be forwarded to the referee more than likely. So, And they've given their time for free to review your paper. So just, just be nice. So obviously, you know, perhaps the reviewer hadn't seen this recent bit of research. Uh, and here's why we want to have this particular bit of information left as it is. And if the editor agrees with you, then that will stay. So that bit of your manuscript stays in the record of science forever because you've argued that it should not be changed to match the reviewer's thought process. And of course, when you do get the comments back from the editor with all the referees comments, read them all through. And then when you read them all through and you and your co-authors decide who's going to edit what, who's going to add what, when you've added all those changes, then go through and polish up the manuscript again, 
making English better because you've added more text. And if you haven't done polishing on the revised paper, so only the original has a good English, then it really looks messy and the chance of being accepted drops tremendously. So, so basically, it's not stupid, it's not, it's not difficult, just, just you've got to be consistent. Check, double check your work, tell a logical clear story and make sure that referees' comments are taken on board and making it better. They make your paper better. They don't go into a list of co-authors. They improve the number of downloads you get, the number of citations you get. So it's great that they care enough to, to do this for your paper. But by make sure that by doing this, you're more likely to be one of the 30% group than the 70% group. Of course, you also got to think very briefly about publication ethics. There's lots of things around this, and I'm not going to go into this too deeply. But um, as authors, we've got lots of rights and privileges, but also we've got to be ethical. Um, so there's things like falsification of results and images. That's a whole separate thing. In publication, you've got things like plagiarism, whereby you're copying yourself, which is self-plagiarism. Uh, you are copying someone else's work without citing them. Uh, you perhaps are uh, not so not listing other people in your work, so that means you're not you've got ghost authors, and it might be you've got conflicts of interest you haven't stated as well. So you've really got certain things going on you've got to be very aware of around uh, ethics. There's whole workshops on publication ethics, um, and if you go to here, the Research Academy, then there's articles on how to become a good peer review person, how to become uh, a better author, uh, how to deal with conflict of interest the statements properly, uh, how to better uh, do grant requests, grant proposals, uh, whole articles about ethics and figure manipulation and understanding what can and cannot be done, and the things about what you can share, what you can't share, and so on. So lots and lots of things are here, and it's a great resource that's there. But of course, there's only so many things you can talk about, as I've done in, in an hour. I could easily do this for three hours, but we don't have three hours. And then that's the reality. So your university library, you might not even know where it is. Go there, talk to them. They've got all sorts of useful information for authors, impact factor, time to first decision, all useful things like that. And of course, check if there's any writing courses. You had a earlier, there was a, a great presentation uh, by a colleague uh, presenter on how to write articles. And this again is, is really good, useful information for you to use. If you're going to be publishing open access, really see what's going on. That the, the policies are changing so fast that the only real people who know what's going on is your librarian. They're the best place to go to know the current situation. And of course, if you do have uh, journal editors or board members on campus, who are linked to a particular journal, ask them for help occasionally. You don't go stalking them, but now and again, you can go to them and say, oh, look, um, this is the title I'm thinking about using. Do you think it's okay or should it be a bit differently? Yeah. And that's, that's accepting the fact that these people in their spare time are working with other journals. And so the fact they are, are linked to a journal means they do care about publication and they might well help you become better. They're not going to pu polish your manuscript for you. You're not going to send them the paper and say, please polish this and send it, send it back to me. That's not what it's about. There are professional text services that do that. No, this is to ask their advice as a seasoned, published author and editor or board member on um, publication process and suggestions. Now, there's questions coming up in a minute, and so therefore uh, that's the point when I will be live to answer these. Um, there's a couple of other resources here which you might find of interest. This is um, a long workshop, two hour one uh, on YouTube here, and there's another one, one hour one on how to be a, a good referee. And there's also in the Researcher Academy, there's a short little uh, recording about seven or eight minutes on how to write a good cover letter to go with your manuscript. So that basically is uh, this one hour presentation. Uh, well, short one hour to allow for questions. Um, but if you've got any questions, please contact me. It's my email address. And of course, with this slide set, 
you can distribute it anywhere as long as you don't edit it. So, so that's the idea. So at that point, I will stop sharing, and I will then pass back to the moderator and then answer any questions that come up. So uh, thank you.